All right, thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. It's a great group in the house and I'm really privileged to be with you this morning. For those of us that is morning and afternoon for some of you, <laughs> or mid morning for some of you. So a, break, a quick breakdown of what happened in our last forum. We, when we decided to do these forums, we decided to, um, we sent out a survey, which um, about 70 or 69 people completed uh, across um, Sub-Sahara Africa with 10, 10 country, including Brazil and uh, India. And from the survey, we found that 83% uh, of the participants said that internet is the biggest barrier to online learning. 51% um, listed computer access as a barrier. And 67% of the participants uh, mentioned that WhatsApp is an available tool or a viable tool that can be used in Sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, the people that attended, they had a very strong desire to continue this, uh, uh, these meetings, which is why we're here today. And we want to collaborate together. So we're here because we want to collaborate and we, we really, we're starting to build out um, a template where we will share with everybody that indicates that they want to collaborate with each other uh, to around accessible, accessibility and also improving methodology. Some of the presenters we had were, were from the international community. Oh, it's IC for International Community for Content Creation and Collaboration. Uh, and then we had Kurum Buka Leadership Solutions, Teachers Training teacher, Teachers Training Together. For some reason, I always say Teachers Training Teachers. And uh, we had Anapola Anakamedes also speak. So uh, with that, and um, with no further ado, let's um, go around one more time and just share some success stories, share um, how this pandemic has affected you, what you've taken away from this pandemic, some good things. We know all the bad things and uh, today let's encourage each other and uh, share our stories of the pandemic and talk about the good things, the things we've learned, the things we've done well, and the things we've accomplished that we were not able to accomplish. I'll start. And one of it is I'm celebrating us today. I'm celebrating the fact that we can wake up. Those of us on LA can wake up at 6 a.m. to come to this meeting. Um, and I'm celebrating that we can come from different parts of the world to talk about education in Sub-Sahara Africa and education in general. Um, if if COVID-19 had not happened, this probably would not be possible. We would have so many other things that we were caught up in that we would not have taught this broadly. So I'm celebrating that and I'm grateful for that, that the pandemic has brought us together. Jennifer, you wanna go? Or anybody else? <laughs> I was just going to say, and then I'll let others speak. I think even in the United States, we are seeing that the pandemic is forcing us to question a system that we've had in place for over a hundred years, um, our public education system. And so there is a lot of pain with that, but there is, I believe there are good questions being asked. And I think we can learn from those in other countries um, who are having to innovate faster um, because the needs might be greater. And so I'm excited to learn here. Anyone can share, you can just pop in. We won't call you by name. <laughs> okay, I think I started before. Let me just share briefly. Uh, hello, this is Dorcas here from here. And I'm also from Kenya. Okay. The, Maybe two points I can share is that this pandemic has really made us to be resilient, more resilient in terms of looking for knowledge and in terms of just getting ready to change. It's like we, we were forced to change. I know most learning was always the traditional learning. We privileged that we were already using some virtual learning here at Pepperdine, but in majority, even in, in in schools like the from K to K12, 
they were doing they were doing traditional learning, but they were forced to actually just move to virtual learning. So that resilience is really encouraging and it shows that education did not stop. Although in other areas, and I acknowledge like in my country, learning actually in most of majority of the schools was, has been hampered very bad. But that resilience and the educators even and the leaders coming together to think of ways how you can propel and continue education so it, it was a, it, has, it is a difficult thing, but it is a thing that has opened educators' eyes. And I can also say that uh, there is more learning. There is more learning using the, more, the very many platforms that are there and discoveries of the many platforms that can be used to propel education. So it's something that it's actually not good, but it has also, it is good because it has opened our eyes as educators to think of other avenues on how we can propel learning to continue. Thank you. Yeah, maybe uh, I probably have the same thoughts, the same feeling. Uh, celebrating the possibilities that uh, online, uh, the, the, the possibilities of having online learning, online teaching, uh, which I've used a lot during this period, especially in teaching my courses. Uh, but also, as uh, uh, the previous speaker just said, it's, it's unfortunate, especially for those in rural parts in Africa in general, and especially in the rural parts of Africa where uh, possibilities for online learning are really, really limited. Um, it could, it's, we even talk about online um, internet facilities or computers, but also lack of electricity in, in those rural parts. Even if they had computers, they can't run or, and things like that. So it's also, uh, while celebrating the possibilities that have come for online learning, I also think about those back there in those parts who cannot also function like uh, the rest of the world. Yeah. Yay. Um, hi everyone. This is uh, this is Zach. Um, I would like to share my my success story. Um, I've been working with um, a few teachers who've been supporting learners during this COVID period. Uh, they have been volunteering at community centers and um, taking their own initiative to support learners who do not have actually anything unless they get that support from the teachers. And one of the things that the, the, you know, one of the teachers said to me was very interesting was that, you know, like, uh, why don't we try and flip things around when schools, let's say they resume? Because uh, at the moment they are supporting like 12 kids, 10 kids, uh, but during normal times, uh, the classes are normally like so large. They have 75 students in a class. They have 80 students, 100 students. The class sizes are very large. So this teacher said like, you know, instead of having 75 students in a classroom for five days a week, why don't we try 15 students for, for one day? And I, I thought that was very interesting. And I asked him, you know, why, why, why do you say so? And, you know, he said that, you know, this could allow for more personalized, uh, you know, student-teacher interaction time with higher level of feedback and, 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 and guidance. And um, to me, is, is, is something that, you know, working with teachers have been like, you know, sharing with them that, yes, you, you really need to interact with students, um, make them collaborate, give them that personalized attention. But... I think during this COVID is when, uh, you know, the teacher has, you know, really realized how much value that student-teacher interaction and thus having small number of students 
can enable those teachers. And then uh, the other teacher, what uh, the other teacher told me that, you know, why don't, you know, why don't you, you know, equip us with, you know, tools and training that could help us so that we can, you know, offer this help to learners more even when they are at home. And um, to me, what I concluded is that, uh, you know, uh, during these COVID closures, um, it has reconfirmed the value of teachers to parents all over the world that it is, you know, critical that we recognize this and we don't lose this. And that, you know, teachers ex execute their vital role as educators for future generations and they need to be supported with professional development and, and, and so forth. And the last uh, successful thing that I would like to share is about, uh, you know, this teacher who um, is in very rural village in, in deep in, in Maasai area for those who come from Kenya. And they literally do not have electricity, they don't have devices, they don't have internet. And this teacher actually told me that actually, sometimes paper works just fine. Um, it only depends on what is on that paper. So he was telling me about these kids who go into the deep rural Maasai village to look after cattle. But what they do, they normally come to this teacher every Monday and then they will collect printed papers of activities. And then they go away the whole week looking after cattle. And then when they come back again, they return the work that they have done to the teacher as they, they, they take the, you know, the other, the other, the other activities that they're supposed to work on. And it is what works in that, in that community. And I thought that is something that was very encouraging for this teacher to go out of his way to create activities, print them, and then get it to the learners so that they can work on them while they are looking after animals. Thank you. Hello, can I go after Zach? Yes, just jump in. <laughs> Fine, thank you. So I just want to extend a little bit from what Zach has said uh, as I deal with the teacher professional development. I think uh, one of the lessons that I've learned, especially during this particular time and something that I can celebrate about is about quality and quality of learning. Uh, when it comes to face-to-face, -to -face, people took things for granted. I'll just carry my notes, go to class, uh, lecture, and that is it. Go dictate notes to students, and that is it. But now, one, I've been dealing with people and it's like they have to rethink. If I'm going to meet my students online, what am I going to do? And now people are scrutinizing and it's like we are looking at student engagement, which is not something that uh, used to bother people when it was face to face. Uh, but I really want to agree that uh, COVID has really helped to scrutinize education. Even right now, ministries of education, they are saying we want to like look at the preparedness of schools uh, for learning. Uh, so that has to really, uh, has really helped us to be able to see. And then post COVID, things will not be the same. People might say we want to go back and teach face to face. But uh, students will run away from you as a teacher because you have nothing to deliver. And they know where they can be able to find something of substance. Uh, and then for us as educators, it is like uh, we are going to teach anywhere in the world. So you are not just bound in your country, Kenya or Cameroon. It's like we are going to be all over uh, being able to share best practice, being able to share classes. And uh, we've seen a lot of collaborations in terms of emerging, in terms of research. Uh, and that is something that moving forward, people will not just say we are doing research uh, within our country or within our institution. It's research that is, uh, will be global and that will really help us even to get some of the solutions we need to the world problems. 
So that is something that I can really celebrate on, the rethinking about teaching, rethinking about education, rethinking learning, and not business as usual. Thank you. We'll take maybe a couple more, and then we can jump in and to our main. Um, sorry, earlier on when we were introducing ourselves, I went on to start on this. <laughs> um, I think let me just uh, the uh, think for me um, three things broadly: rethinking, which has just been talked about, rethinking. Uh, things are not the same, rethinking student engagement, rethinking assessment, um, but then also a lot of learning. I think this whole season with COVID has really pushed us uh, to, to learn a lot, sometimes within a very short time in making that transition to online teaching. But as we have learned, I think it has also really um, brought to the surface some of the blaring um, inequalities and just the difference between those who have access to certain things and those who do not have access to certain things. And uh, the need to respond to that in whichever way that, that, that we can. Um, I'm thinking of a group of teachers who are trying to reach out to their students using WhatsApp and they send homework via WhatsApp and then the students then, but the parents don't even have internet. And so the parents have to walk to the nearest school um, to, to the school to access Wi-Fi, then to be able to download the assignments and then put back, you know, download the assignments and take them to the children at home. And the challenges of the parents being too busy to sometimes, sometimes not even being able to go and download those assignments. And so it has brought some of these things to the fore and uh, it's pushing us to think and think of a way forward. What do we do in those in those circumstances? What can we do to support children that are in those circumstances? There's a willingness by the teachers, a willingness by the parents, but then what can we do as educators to bridge some of these glaring gaps? And then finally, just I've appreciated collaboration. Um, uh, COVID-19, the challenges that we are going through has really brought people together to really think, what do we do? And so I, I really appreciate a forum like this one. Thank you. Anybody else dying to go? <laughs> Lack of a better word. I think Berta raised her hand, maybe. Oh, hey, Berta. Please do share. Okay, let me say something also, but it's not different from Mary's uh, experience. We are during this uh, pandemic lockdown. We have been doing many things and learned a lot because we at our school also we use the group WhatsApp. At the beginning of the year, we already have a, a students in their class with the, their WhatsApp group. It helped us a lot uh, to give them uh, uh, activities to do at work, uh, at home, sorry, and uh, to interact with the parents on the education of their, their children. Now, during uh, lockdown, we used those classes to continue our learning. And uh, when they said that some activities can go, uh, can start working, now we had a big problem. Parents, they were not longer with the children at home. Then we changed the program and say that the uh, teachers can prepare something, they send the work, and then during the weekend, they can be uh, uh, in touch with the learners. So on a Saturday and Sunday, they can have interaction with the recording, and they ask questions on what they, they didn't um, do, understand well. So since March 2020, we have been uh, teaching, but Still, they say that it's enough. We are very tired. Now, for now, we gave them only one month for break so that they can have a rest. So they, we continue, we continue to, to teach them 
till we say that we behave to rest a bit. So uh, with this pandemic, we can say that it helped us. It's a success story because we have been close to parents and the, the relationship Parents were involved in very, very much in the education of their children. We know that when the school will be easy now to understand each other, <laughs> because many times when we call the parents to come or at school, they, they issue if there is an issue at, the, at the school. Easy. But for now, now they understand. that we are very thankful to the teachers also. So I think that is a, now a success story during this pandemic in education sector. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, yes, Beth. And uh, thanks everybody for sharing. Sorry, we didn't have enough time to go through everybody uh, maybe at the end of the day tomorrow, we might be able to dig deep and just have conversations around this topic again. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Tai Houston. I, think I, I hear your name, Dr. Tai, and I think Houston, Texas. So please forgive any <laughs> poor pronunciation on my part. Um, Dr. Tai is an accomplished public private partner professional and she holds a doctorate degree in global, in organizational leadership from Pepperdine University. Um, she's very moderate, so I'm going to throw in another accomplishment of hers, which she would have rather I put it up, but I don't say it, but I will say it because I just love her so much. <laughs> she, um, she's, she positions and leverages clients to maximize brands, interest and scope. She works with Fortune 500 companies and corporations to access funds for businesses and nonprofits, funds and sponsorships for, for uh, businesses and nonprofits. The big thing that I really appreciated that she has done is um, acquire a 30 million federal grant for K-12 systems. K-12 is, uh, for, for those of us that don't know, is the uh, the secondary high school, every every ed child education below um, high school, from high school and below. And we want to appreciate you for this great work that you're doing, Dr. Tai, and we want to thank you so much for giving us your time and your wisdom and your knowledge. I always know that these things are not easily earned. So we know you worked hard for them and we are very grateful for your generosity today. Thank you. and. You can take it over. Thank you as well. Ruth, um, you're gonna share your screen? I think you have co-hosts, so you can go ahead and share. Okay, very well. Well, I'm very excited to be here this morning with this distinguished audience to share with you some of my insights as an experienced and seasoned private-public partnership developer. I have been in and around this arena of fundraising and partnerships for many years, and it's always been an exciting journey for me to be able to leverage dollars for the least of le these, if you will. And so my talk today will be framed around the importance of seeing the global perspective, whether it be a school, a university, or a country, and where those key elements and key stakeholders are, and how we can synchronize their skills, education, and passion for the greater good. Ironically, I chose a country, a sub-Saharan country, Cameroon, Africa, and Many people on this session today at this forum, I hear, are from this country. I tailor made this presentation just for you. You're a beautiful people with a beautiful topography. And as such, I wanted to use this in a spirit of storytelling as a way that I leverage what I do professionally and find great 
gratitude in doing so. I have worked and helped to leverage dollars from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Dell Foundation, just to name a few. And I'm now looking at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which they're based out right outside of San Francisco, because we always want to look at new opportunities to bring in dollars, as, as well as those institutes are very excited about helping. And bo both of these entities have a global perspective in terms of outreach, and that's very commendable and impressive. As I mentioned, the, the, pop, the topography of this country is quite astounding. It's lush with greenery and foliage, and wonderful waterfalls, not to mention its minerals, timber, and agricultural assets. The president of this country, ironically, is 87 years old. It, it looks like that's a theme that we're holding on to presidents longer and longer. And secondly, uh, it's also, it speaks to the political ramifications that may take, bring to bear as you look to fundraise. And I think of uh, our distinguished uh, global leadership and change program chair, Dr. June Schmida Ramirez, who speaks about the spell it model, looking at a holistic standpoint when you approach fundraising and partnership. And we'll speak a little bit about that. But in the interest of time, I want to stay on point and within your time allotted. Uh, it's a ruling party, is the Cameroonian People's Democratic Movement. It has enjoyed several years of stability, yet there have been some challenges with regard to the secessionist movement. Uh, there's always opportunities for people to want their independence, if you will, so it's not uncommon, but it seemingly has been managed in a, in a very uh, respectable way. Uh, with, as we know, with any population growth, there's also going to be growth in terms of poverty. And right now, we're showing that there's been an increase by 12% in the country of Cameroon. Continuing with the overview, uh, it's considered, when we think of the World Bank, uh, they classify uh, global economies, national economies, from a high to middle to low. And Cameroon, as like other companies, have their strategic plans and their vision, and they're looking to grow uh, to some 12% in, in between now and 2035. But that, as it stands, it has a population of about 25 people. I live in Houston, Texas. We have about 30 million people in this state, just to give you a perspective. And I want to say that California has about 49, just under 50 million people, to put it in perspective. Uh, it is located along the Atlantic Ocean. I've seen the beautiful ocean all over the world. It's amazing how it can look, as well as the Pacific Ocean, for that matter. But it is bordered by Chad, Equatorial Guinea, Gabo, and Nigeria. I've had the pleasure to visit uh, Ghana, Africa. I've also been to Accra uh, in particular. I've been to Lagos, Nigeria. I saw the beautiful landscape of Cape Town, South Africa, and I can't wait to make my next visit to the mother continent. As you well know, not only in Cameroon, but throughout the 54 states that uh, call home uh, to that beautiful continent, is endowed with rich natural resources, including oil and gas, minerals, and timber. It's agricultural fruits, Pun intended include coffee, cocoa, maize, and cassava. Cassava is the way I believe it's pronounced specifically. Its people are beautiful, they're vibrant. It is the largest economy in the Central African Economic and Monetary Community, a region experiencing an economic crisis as a result to the downturn in, the two, in 2014. I'm in the oil and gas capital of the world. I know the impact that has on the world economy. I had the pleasure in my dissertation of STEM pathways, factors that inspire women to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. So I had the opportunity to hear firsthand what it was like to be an, a, an up and coming executive and to reach the C-suite ranks, but have survived that very volatile industry that we call oil and gas. Also, your real GDP gross domestic product is expected to grow by roughly 8% between 2020 and 2035. And overall, I want to say that would be a very aggressive goal because on average, I want to say you've been hovering around 4% in growth. And some countries have not had any growth at all. And we haven't even put the actual spin on the impact of COVID-19. Uh, and looking at the World Bank's report, it's a credible source. 
and the vision for Cameroon 2035 in terms of fiscal discipline. We talk about collaboration. We talk about the impact of macroeconomics. We speak to inflation and the rate of economic growth. That would dictate the trajectory of any country, which would speak to the, the uh, plight of their people. We also talk about the national debt. It's my understanding that France is the primary funder of Cameroon. I would want to say that the United States would probably be second. Uh, in fact, I did verify that information. And so national debt is something that has to be managed in terms of growth. As a small business owner, I'm always looking at the gross uh, irrevocable, but more importantly, what is the net? After all the bills have been paid, am I still surviving? Am I still above water? So I take it very personal, even on a small business level. And of course, the strength, the, you want to strengthen your social protection systems, uh, your, your, your seniors, you know, the poverty, how, what kind of services are being available? Are you maximizing uh, the monies that you do have so it reaches more people across a broader range? Then we want to speak about, of course, in terms of your vision, uh, spending better and more in health, health and wellness. When I think of the question, what has the COVID impact from a positive perspective, as Ruth said, what does it mean to me? Well, it means self-care. It means that you want to be holistically, physically, emotionally strong so that you can be the global leader and have those skills and competencies that are going to be very relevant as we look at this global world as global leaders and scholars. And of course, efficiency is the point of my speech today and my talk is because it's education. As, as Malcolm X once said, if the, if the mothers are backwards, the children are backwards. So I always look at females as leaders, and it's kind of been the world that I've delved in in terms of science, technology, engineering, and math, because I know with, as, as those practitioners move through their careers, they're problem solvers at the very minimum of what they do, which makes systemic impact in our contemporary societies. Moving forward. The beauty of Pepperdine University and its faculty, and we, we're lucky to have two with us today, of course, Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Espino, they have many talents and they tend to share their talents globally, which I think it's, it's humbling. But I also think of the leaders with those great, great minds, but I also think that we're not working in a vacuum. And I say we specifically, uh, and having taken some courses in the Global Leadership and Change Program, I was greatly impacted by the impact of the United Nations that is spearheaded under the leadership of Antonio Guterres, who is the Secretary General of such a mammoth of an organization. We talk about global governance and in, in institutional organizations and how they work collaboratively. So in thinking about fundraising and marketing and branding and partnership development, we have to look at the totality of the resources and we have to make it compelling to those leaders that they need to support us. And they've done that in very systemic ways and creating ambassadors and regional pockets that they're able to funnel monies right where they need to go and be the good stewards of those dollars once we've worked very hard and been successful in, in receiving those very needed funds. I also think of specifically the United Nations. Why? Because they want to end world hunger. They want to, they want to create world peace. They provide military might when countries become un dis dis combobulated and un unstabilized. And more importantly, I think of COVID-19 and those countries where the, the people are living on $5 a day and $5.50 a day. Imagine the progress in polio that has been impacted because of the leadership of the United Nations. Yet because of COVID-19, we find ourselves moving three, three feet back and three steps back. How do you recover? Some of us will not recover individually and some countries will have a hard time recovering. That's why a global perspective with a global mindset and constantly developing your skills and honing so you can make an impact. Your one impact makes a big difference when it's a collective community. So there again, we're telling a story of passion, of, of, of being developed intellectually and sharing. And so with that, I, I wanna go on and say also in looking at COVID-19 specifically, I looked at Cameroon and I looked at over a period of two weeks, these are your numbers, it's, it's striking. And I, I know right now when I think of the world, the numbers are around 28 million cases, about 800,000 deaths. This is globally. In America, about 5 million cases, and we're just under 200,000 deaths, and we're predicting to have about 220,000 deaths, uh, 20 deaths in the next um, two weeks. So it's a global pan pandemic. 
it gets all of our attention. It's the equal opportunity destroyer, unless we go on top of it. And we're working very feverishly. That is our health officials like Burks, to name a few, and of course, Fauci and, and the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, Infectious Disease, et cetera. But these are the numbers. If you look at, at the red, those are the deaths in the bar chart with the red. And then we would see the recoveries. That's, that's comforting. You know, more people are surviving, even in sub-Saharan countries. And then we see the active cases. So respectively, we're looking at about 18,000 plus cases and deaths hovering around 398. This was in the last two weeks in Cameroon. And these, this source is from the, your state health department officials. There again, it's a vibrant people. They're colorful, just like their flag. It's bustling. There are a lot of great minds right here that we'll be working with to solve some of these problems, in particular as it relates to education and our young people. Again, I've been in and around education, having worked at a major research and teaching university as an executive for 16 years, collaborating with leaders, senators, CEOs, those, that was my purview. Those were the people that we had to make impressions upon. And as I like to say, we, we like to talk about the four eyes. And for me, that stays with me all the time. Specifically, we identify where is the talent, where is the skills, where are the resources. Interest them. With the interest, you inspire and ignite imaginations. And with that, they begin to invest. I don't like to use the word fundraising because it sounds like it's a project. Okay, I have to raise 50 million for this event. It's a gala. Some tables may run at $50,000 and accord, accordingly, we accord different accoutrements in terms of marketing and branding. But more importantly, we have to look at the partnership development, the strengthening of relationships. And I, I find that most admirable in, in Dr. Eric Hamilton. He knows people from all over the world, but he's not just a name dropper. He has relationships with those people. And he does that very well with his students. And, and I find that to be quite impressive and one of his best practices that he may not be aware that he drops gems to, to his students and colleagues alike in terms of who he is, essence, in terms of his essence as a man. If we want to have some takeaways for further discussion, I submit to you that when we think of public-private sector interaction and collaboration in education in particular, we have to look at all the stakeholders. Where are they? If you're running an organization, I run a business, I, I look at the people I'm working with and who are working for me or working with me. They all have to be on board. It's all hands on deck when we have a mission. Everyone from the person that picks up the phone, the politeness in their voice, you never know, it could be a potential donor. And it's a synergy that you create when you're on a mission to make something happen. So what are we talking about specifically? We're looking at the community members. We all are a part of an extended community. Who are those practitioners and researchers? I think of in America, Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States. I think of the Pew Research Center. I think of the Brookings Institution. I think of the, the Women's Law Center. All of those brilliant minds that are doing research to give us what we need to be able to, to leverage and tell the story to fund those initiatives that are going to help our young people be successful in their life. So specifically, think about who's around you and never take anyone for granted in terms of skills. We've learned that more than anything. We're not even talking with each other face to face with, where I can reach out and touch. We do have a virtual community, but still we can be impactful until the times when we're able to get together and share and break bread and talk about collaborative initiatives. But there again, we, the entrepreneurs, they want return on investment. Very important. We talk about money, money, money. It's stewarding the dollars. We have quarterly plans. We get good reports because we want to continue with the relationship. We don't just want to fundraise. We want to build partnerships. And with that, you need to build trust and you need to be accountable and deliver and, and, and exceed the expectations of the people who are funding you. Because that's the way it's going to set you to be more competitive because there's always going to be competition. So be mindful of this community. Uh, your, your extended community of neighbors and friends, your professional organizations, people that you take for granted that are in key and strategic places that can, can move your, your, your mission forward. Pardon me. As you can see, I get very passionate about education and finding ways that we can leverage dollars for our young people. Specifically, uh, public-private partnerships, I did some research 
and, and it was jogged, my memory was jogged in my uh, excitement about looking into ways that we could collaborate on behalf of education post COVID-19. And I thought about what Ruth said and, and one organization, Orange, well, actually there were two, and this is with UNESCO of the United, of United Nations, Orange and Vodafone, they are communications companies. And what has COVID done? It, is, it has made it compelling and incumbent upon the private sector to give what they can to provide internet services for people who otherwise would not have had the opportunity. I was on a Zoom session with a Microsoft executive not too long ago, and she spoke about the fact that if it were not for COVID-19, they would not know all of the small pockets and rural areas of sub-Saharan countries that they are now providing internet access to. And so that, that in and of itself makes a big difference. He says, who would have ever thought? I mean, we thought we could never get to everyone, but now we're making an attempt. We're compelled to do so. I think of the Gates Foundation because they've given so much, Bill and Melinda Gates, but they also have a, a, an interest in COVID. You, you've seen them, uh, Fox News, uh, CNN, you know, B, C, BCC, etc. So the point is he's everywhere trying to make a difference with his dollars and his influence so that he can help to get behind uh, or in front of, if you will, this COVID-19. So funding technology and, structure makes, and infrastructure makes a big difference. Uh, we were also looking at other countries like Jamaica and um, other, like Morocco, et cetera. So it's just having access. And then of course, I have my eye on Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. I've, I've heard them speak on, on, on several occasions here lately, mostly through Zoom. But they're making big changes and, and systemic change by making contributions in the area of health, education, science, and research and energy. And then, of course, UNESCO, uh, they're, they're working with, as I mentioned earlier, these telecommunications companies so that we can have digital education. And then United Way, I'm like, is there a United Way in uh, Cameroon? Sure there is. Uh, and, and I looked at the regions where, you know, we have the most poverty, to, if you will, the north, the south, the east. So where do we go, according to Antonio? You go where the, the need is most. Because if you're servicing the need of those who need it most, those most needy, if you will, then everything else will kind of fall in line. So when I might think about fundraising and partnership development, especially when you're looking at uh, poverty or education, you, there again, you gotta go where the need is most, because that's where you make the biggest impact. And as I wrap up, I, um, as I said earlier, it's an all hands on deck approach. And in and, and, and the world of organizational leadership and global leadership and change, our faculty has taught us the importance of different change models. There are about 47 out there. I tend to like uh, Cotter because he talks about an eight step process. But at the end of the day, it's a sense of urgency and making sure the right people are in the right places and the right leadership top style is, is scaled to the right team and that global mindset, because we're managing multifaceted teams, people from all over the world. We're talking global corporations. We need to know where they are in your country, and which ones, you know, what side are they on in terms of politics. There's so many issues to be, to be uh, taken, not to be taken rather for granted. And that's why collectively people meet and get around the table and strategize and come up with a plan. So that's what, and then once you come up with a plan, there's also, how do we manage that change? Do we need training for our teachers? Yes, we do. Well, Microsoft has a wonderful program that teaches, teach, that trains teachers in math and science. So knowing where the monies are, knowing where the traction is, and taking advantage of it. It kind of wraps up my talk, uh, but there again, there's a lot of information. Uh, what I wanted to share just a little bit more importantly, I wanted to excite you about the impact of the collaboration. We can't all do it in a vacuum, but if each of us makes a difference and, and gets in where we fit in, as, as, Cheryl, Duck, as Cheryl Sandberg said, the CEO of, um, COO rather, of, of, pardon me, she's a Facebook, she's go, just lean in. And as women, we're beginning to lean in more. And I think it's good because arguably, I think we have better instincts, even as leaders. No pun intended or no disrespect, gentlemen, but yeah, look at the vibrancy. We're the caretakers. We take care of the children. We take care of our spouses, believe it or not. We take care of the elders, but yet we still are building careers and we're being leaders in our respective communities, professions, and, 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 and in political uh, uh, positions, so public office holders. So we're seeing more of that, and I think with that, 
comes better stability, more trust, and more comfort. And these are some of my references. That would conclude my, my presentation. If you have questions, I'm pleased to answer them at your convenience. Well, wow, thank you so much. That was amazing. It, it really got me excited. Um, any questions? It, it doesn't have to be about Cameroon. It could be based on what she said. But was that a surprise, Ruth? <laughs> oh, that was, yeah, that was a beautiful surprise. It was like, oh, look at Cameroon. They highlighted. I said, why not? If our leader is Cameroonian, why not? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the love. <laughs> All right, the floor is open for questions or discussions around this topic. Can I say something briefly? Yeah, so uh, I, I really appreciate this talk. Uh, first of all, as a Cameroonian, it was a pleasant surprise. Uh, and uh, the facts are telling and uh, it, it's, it's uh, when I listen to you right through to the end, then I, it seems like it's a, in the same way, it's the global situation you're kind of presenting, even if, you know, you're using Cameroon. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, like, what was, how, uh, maybe we'll have to discuss this at a greater, greater detail later on or so, but I'm just wondering how would, how can we translate all of this to the people who are actually in need? Uh, you know, the, the, the people who are really, really in need. You mentioned that if where you can make the greatest impact is you actually go to where there is the greatest need. And so I'm just wondering uh, the kinds of partnerships that, you know, people like us who are in, probably in, you know, in the ground in Cameroon, how can we actually realize these kinds of partnerships so that we can actually reach out to those who are really in need? There again, the impact of global governance, we can't do it in a vacuum. The World yes. Health Organization, UNESCO, United Nations, that's what they're there for. They're there to reach out to nations and to help them uplift their economies. And with that, we identify those corporate partners who have a vested interest. But guess, guess what? Because if they're there, let's say ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is worldwide. They have a vested interest in the people and the communities where their corporations are because that's their workforce development. So it does require someone who, who is an expert, no doubt, in the arena that can identify where the stakeholders are and put the right people in the right places and come up with your plan. Make sure that there's situational leadership, like we do a spell it. We look at the sociological elements of a school, of a university, of a country. We look at the economic impact. Are, they, are you operating in the red? Are you, do you have growth? It, are you on track for growth? We look at the legal aspects. We look at the socioeconomic. We look at the technological. So there's so many parameters. You can't say, well, what can you do for me? We first have to look at what are the needs? And we're looking at intercultural, right? That's the I and spell it. The intercultural, multifaceted, multi-skilled, myriad teams that we're managing and, and the whole notion of followership and leadership and followership. I mean, there's so many moving parts, but if I were to work with a group as I have in real time many times, we look at the leaders of the chambers of commerce within our city. We look at the university officials. We look at the, the corporate leaders. We look at the community leaders who have impact, whose voices are heard. We look at our legislators. So it's multiple stakeholders that we're looking at to come to bear on whatever the mission is. And then we come in with a model that enables us to, at different points in time, see if we're on point. And then we have to go back and see if we really made some change. We can't say we're good because we think we're good. We've got to show the performance metrics because that's what your entrepreneurial investors and corporate partners are going to be seeking. They don't want to pat on the back and a thank you. They want to know that their dollars are being well invested and stewarded because if they're not, they're going to someplace else. So just creating the team and then coming up with a systemic plan that builds in situation analysis, change management, and then an evaluative piece. And that's done 
throughout certain points in that timeline from beginning to end. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. Thank you. Thank you so much. It makes sense. Rose, thank you. Um, well, I, I, still, I know I still have something to say, but Dr. Hamilton made a comment. Esther, will you give me a second? Uh, Dr. Hamilton, you made a, a comment. Will you, do you want to elaborate on that comment before Estelle jumps in? Sure, and I'll do it quickly because I want to hear what Estelle was going to say. Yes. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, Dr. Tai's comment about organizations like uh, the UN or UNESCO, but I, I made the comment that I think they're difficult to rely on uh, for many reasons. Uh, and I want to suggest uh, Ruth, for you and, and Jennifer and others, that a good way to go is, uh, or a good path to proceed is to organize something that's direct to an entity that you form or that, uh, that can pursue support for a specific uh, line of action or <clears throat> course of action. Um, so there are, uh, of course, other larger organizations, but uh, I think some of these, in, in terms of resource mobilization, you, you are the ones to, to pull it together. And as Ty said, put it together into a systemic plan. But now I'm eager to hear what um, Estelle had to say. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Hamilton. And thank you also to Dr. Houston for this focus on our country. It's so refreshing. <laughs> Um, I, I actually was going in the same direction as Dr. Hamilton, thinking about the culturally responsive dimension of this uh, help coming from the outside and uh, the danger of scratching uh, where there's no itch. I think that we, we see the, the situation from afar. How can we manage to really think small instead of thinking big? Uh, and um, one, for example, my, the way my organization works is by uh, establishing contact with teachers in local international schools, African international schools, because this is the scene I have access to. And then uh, as I provide professional development in these schools, identifying teachers who are keen on doing things locally. And these teachers would actually go to their own villages and start conversations with the idea that they can learn from the, the local teachers uh, about their reality and their needs, as well as bring in some aspects of, of innovation via what they know about international education. This is a system that is kind of has to be tested still. I don't have real data on, on it as, as yet. But uh, to conclude one aspect not to be neglected is the local link and of course the language uh, when you want to help a rural school and you don't speak the local language people might be very polite with you but once you've left they they can completely forget about what you were trying to bring thank you thank you so much Estelle anybody else has extra feedback To address Estelle's comment, I just wanted to say, I hear what you're saying. Of course, that's why we have interpreters. It's no way that if we're global leaders, we're gonna speak every language in any country we could possibly be working with, but that's not to say that our talents and skills are not warranted. So, and, and that's why we need to have those people who are trained and multilingual. But I wanna also place emphasis that this talk was also on public private partnerships. So I couldn't have gotten the work that I've gotten done just with working with nonprofit organizations, but they have a special role oftentimes in stewarding those dollars, which sometimes can be problematic. But it, it's, it's, it's the corporate dollars that we're moving, but as the paradigm shift is being made, if you may, because of COVID-19, we're now having United Way work with those telecommunications companies. That's why I use that as an example, which Ruth, is, is, you, you made the point and you discovered it and you, you sent me an email, several of us, and I, and I said, wow, this is great. So that's an example that's being forced primarily. But let me be clear, it's the corporate dollars that's going to move the needle. But we need to do it in collaboration with those entities. And when we think of the United Nations, if you look at the structure, they have ambassadors that are strategically lo located regionally. 
And that's where the, the rubber meets the road, not at the big, you know, center, if you will, on the dais. It's where the, the monies and, and the services are allocated. And then, of course, we have to do requests for proposals. You have to look at organizations and who's given and where they're given an education. And luckily, it's gotten streamlined because they get so much money. So if you know of an organization that's, that's given money, there are protocols. Usually, you have to complete a form. There's a timeline. There's not one person making that decision. It's a roundtable effect. And, and that's made it easier for me as an officer in that area, if you will, that there's the process. And it's very clear, and it's very intentional, and it's supposed to be objective. So specifically from a step standpoint, it's looking at those philanthropic arms of those corporations, their foundations, their public affairs offices, because that's where the money is. I mean, I get great pleasure in a company saying, here's $20,000, Ty, I want you to put it into this K through 12 STEM school. I'm being paid to, to give someone else's money away, but it's making, it's corporate citizenship. And I've had that pleasure to do that. So the monies are there. And sometimes they go un, unasked, like scholarships at universities. If you don't apply, you can't win it if you're not in it. But let me be very clear that the dollars will come from the corporations, but they also want to see collaboration. They want to see that dime spent as many times and, and that within that mission and whatever, whatever that goal is, but they want to see the touch points of their dollars. And of course, Dr. Hamilton knows this best, having worked very many years as a leader and as a consultant, if you will, with the National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Education, where they give away tens of millions, collectively billions of dollars in the STEM space. And there again, sometimes more money doesn't necessarily mean better performance, because in New York in particular, we spend $15,000 per pupil per year. And we've got countries like Finland and, and, and uh, South Korea where they're spending far less, 4,000. And their performance metrics are off the charts when you think of PISA and the TIMS exam. So we got to see where the money's being invested, but are we getting any, any output? And that's what the investor is going to see. This is what we're expecting. We want you to integrate this STEM curriculum within your core, your core and we want to see at every quarter some systemic change, whether it be in teacher training, whether it be an exposure to students to science initiative, et cetera. So yes, it has to be private, public-private partnerships, ideally, ideally. Thank you, Dr. Tai. Um, Ruth and I are conscious of the time that we have, and that was such a rich presentation and inspiring at the big picture level. Um, what our hope was um, for tomorrow's session is to build on this big picture inspiration and then to start like what Estelle was talking about. How does this apply locally? How can we use the, the wealth of knowledge each of you has in your local region and even assessing what are the relationships as Dr. Tai talked about, who are the um, key parties involved who are um, already doing good work in your region and might there be ways to collaborate together within your country or within a broader region. So we are viewing tomorrow as a workshop, a hands-on um, coming together to brainstorm uh, really some questions that I'll just kind of throw them up there. And then Ruth is going to send these um, out tonight so that you can kind of prime your pump in a sense. Um, oops, my screen sharing is paused. Anyway, we will send you some questions, but really asking what is the greatest need? If accessibility is the greatest need in your area, um, then who are some of those corporations that even technology corporations like Dr. Tai highlighted the orange um, communications firm? Are there corporations in your area and that we could access? Um, what are some of those creative ideas? And then we are going to see um, how this particular network could even come together, give you a template that you could use to apply for some funds or to um, or where we might be able to assist with that as well. So um, we are taking this uh, in Rwanda, they say bohoro bohoro, slowly by slowly, uh, step by step, 
And our hope is that the brain power in this group is going to produce something that we don't even know exists yet, um, but what, which we could support one another in. So tomorrow it will be the same time. It will be um, really focused more as a workshop where you'll be in breakouts together, talking and dreaming together. So we hope you will come back for that. We know we will have some new people tomorrow as well. We just want to thank Dr. Tai for sharing. Um, I want to thank Anna Paula. She put some really creative videos of, or uh, pictures of what um, they've created um, to respond to the need in Brazil. And so um, there are some good ideas right here in this room. So thank you so much for joining us today. We will follow up with an email with those questions and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. If you cannot join us, we will also send recording or um, some notes from tomorrow's conversation. So thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for your leadership, Jennifer. Well, this is Ruth, thank you. And uh, we'll look Ruth forward to course. seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. See you tomorrow, Anapola. Thank you, Anapola.